As reports of vanishing multi-year ice in the Arctic return to the news, the U.S. Congress is in the midst of constructing its attempt at a comprehensive environmental policy. At the center of the debate is how to best reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Approaches have broken down into three basic categories, cap and trade emission credits markets, carbon taxes, and straight up regulation of carbon pollution. And while experts and advocates outside the walls of Congress have been calling for varieties of all three, President Obama and leading members of the Democratic Party have put strict limits on the debate inside Congress. And I once again call on Congress to send me legislation that places a market-based cap on carbon pollution, which will then drive uh, and incent the kind of innovation and uh, dynamic new clean energy economy uh, that can create jobs and new businesses all across America. So the result is the Waxman-Markey bill, a 900-plus page proposal that includes the creation of a cap-and-trade emissions credit market. The idea is to, instead of having a regulatory approach where you would tell each emitter, say each power plant or each factory or each automobile, how much to reduce and specify, even some, some regulations would specify the technology, is to create some flexibility about how to do that and set overall limits and let the players in the, in the system choose how to make the reductions most efficiently. So that's, that's the basic idea of cap and trade. Um, one of the problems with that is it creates volatility. Um, cap and trade is what they call a quantity-based mechanism as opposed to a price mechanism. You can set either the quantity of emissions or the price of emissions, but since they depend, since one variable depends on the other, you can't set both. So you set the quantity of emissions and under cap and trade the price fluctuates. And what we've seen in cap and trade systems elsewhere, they have one for SO2 emissions in the United States and the European Union has started a cap and trade system. It's some pretty wild price swings in emission allowance prices. Proponents of cap and trade claim it will give rise to technological innovation. Handley claims that the wild price behavior discourages investment and gives rise to another kind of innovation, speculative finance. It creates a secondary market where people are setting up derivatives. If you're a, if you're a coal-fired power plant and you don't want to worry about the price swings in the emission allowance prices, you can buy a hedging instrument, a derivative, that'll say, we're going to flatten out the price. Basically, if it goes up, we're going to pay you the difference in price on some particular day in the future. So it's a way to basically buy an insurance policy. But what that means is there's, there's another side of that transaction and there's a whole secondary market that mirrors the real market in carbon allowances. And if you, if you kind of think about what's happened with the mortgage-backed securities in the last year, that was an example of a, of a primary market which also had a secondary market that was actually in some ways larger in terms of the capital involved and unregulated the derivatives market that in, in some ways it becomes the tail wagging the dog the derivatives market drives the, the price of the primary market and so you get extreme fluctuations and speculative bubbles what the um, House Ways and Means Committee has been considering is skipping the whole trading aspect and just predictably setting a price which people call a carbon tax a carbon price it's a way to gradually increase the cost of emissions, which has the same effect of cap and trade of, of creating a, an incentive for reductions and an incentive for investment in alternative energy and in green energy, and an, and an incentive for making investments in efficiency. Any attempt to put a cost on carbon, either through cap and trade or through a carbon tax, will increase the cost of energy. But who is going to bear the brunt of that cost increase? And it's particularly a problem for low-income households because they spend more of their income on energy than the people at the high end. And the total amount is much more at the high end. P the rich people fly more, they live in bigger houses, they drive more, less efficient and bigger automobiles. But as a percentage of income, the low-income people are hurt more. Cap Handley argues that the revenue created by a carbon tax can be used in various ways, such as dividends to the poor, to compensate for its ill effects. Cap and trade could also create a revenue stream by auctioning off the carbon emission allowances to the emitters, a strategy that Obama stressed during his campaign. I think a cap and trade system makes more sense. That's why I proposed it, because you can be very specific in terms of how we're going to reduce the greenhouse gases by a particular level. 
Uh, now, what you have to do is you have to combine it with a 100% auction. In other words, every little bit of pollution that is sent up into the atmosphere, uh, that polluter is getting charged for it. Not only does that ensure that they don't gain the system, but you're also generating billions of dollars that can be invested in solar and wind and biodiesel. Now, under a cap and trade, there will be a cost. Plants are going to have to retrofit uh, their equipment and that's going to cost money and they will pass it on to consumers. We have an obligation to use some of the money that we generate to shield low income uh, and fixed income individuals from higher electricity prices. But Conversely, the Waxman-Markey bill would see only 15 percent of the allowances auctioned off and 85 percent of them given away for free. There was a hearing a couple weeks ago when they were introducing the bill and Congressman Joe Barton asked the panelists one by one who were industry folks, you know, utilities and energy companies that were supporters of the cap and trade provision. He said, if you don't include in the bill, if we change the bill to eliminate free allowances, would you support this cap and trade proposal? And one by one, the answer was no, 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 no. So they're supporting it because they expect to get a piece of this allowance pie. And as you saw, 85% are being divvied up. But what about emissions? Can cap and trade make a significant reduction? NASA's James Hansen, co-discoverer of global warming and a proponent of emission reductions since the early 80s, has stated his desire for the bill to fail, stating that any strategy that does not efficiently move the U.S. away from dependence on coal is already a failure. If you look at CO2 emissions per unit of energy, coal is the biggest, Petroleum is in the middle, natural gas is the lowest. And in terms of our total emissions, it's even, the, the spread is even wider. So yes, coal has to be the target. And well, a gradually increasing carbon tax is a way to do that, to efficiently phase out coal. Wind power is now available for, 50, for roughly 15% more than coal is. Well, if you had a carbon tax that added 5% a year to the price of coal, electricity, in three years, wind's, wind is cheaper than coal. And if you start, if you do that trajectory now, and investors know that's where it's going in three years or five years or whatever your time horizon is, the investment capital that would, that would have gone into coal isn't going there. So that's the kind of a price signal that you need economy-wide to start making the shift away from coal. The Energy and Commerce Committee is probably the most coal-friendly committee on Capitol Hill. And the coal interests for example, got these huge amounts of free allowances that mean the real phase out of coal is postponed, if it happens at all under this bill. The Environmental Protection Agency, who recently declared carbon dioxide a danger to public health and welfare, has joined Obama in putting their support behind the cap and trade initiative. I have said over and over, as has the President, that we do understand that there are costs to the economy of addressing global warming emissions and that the best way to address them is through a gradual move to a market-based program like cap and trade. Should the Waxman-Markey bill work as its supporters claim, annual CO2 emissions in the U.S. wouldn't fall below 2005 levels until 2026, 17 years from now. This is a far cry from the 20 percent reduction by 2020 being called for by the UN's climate change panel. This shortfall is due in large part to a practice known as carbon offsetting. Come back for part two to find out the dirt on carbon offsets. Donate today and receive a new documentary film available to members of the Real News Network. The History of the National Security State with legendary author Gore Vidal. Bonus features of the DVD include an in-depth response to Vidal from ex-CIA analyst Ray McGovern, who served under seven U.S. presidents, an exclusive interview with Colin Powell's former chief of staff Larry Wilkerson, and an insightful interview with oil policy analyst Antonia Yuhas. The news magazine of the screen. Living glimpses of history in the making. Hollywood and Washington, there's a symbiotic relationship. They both deal with illusions. Reality doesn't often uh, play much of a part. I think I saw through a myth of the uh, Cold War almost from the beginning. 
I was a Washington political kid from a political family. Roosevelt first had radio because he had a, this great speaking voice and everyone liked to hear. Truman proceeded to break every arrangement that Roosevelt had set up for a peaceful coexistence. And Truman thought that it would be a good idea. Why not just stay armed all the time? And then he devised the national security state. You've got to go up and swear allegiance to the United States or else you're a commie. I mean, we, were, we had imported fascism. We get Dwight Eisenhower, who said that we have this great military industrial complex. It is a dangerous thing. And he said, this is going to change everything. And the way our country's governed, it's going to change us politically. Along comes Jack Kennedy, who wanted to make his mark, believed in the Cold War. But he said, in this kind of politics, it is the appearance of things that matters. I think everybody should take a sober look at the world about us. The national security state still exists, only it isn't communism anymore, it's terrorism. This is the most serious thing that has happened in the history of the United States. Knowledge is power. We need an honest new system. We need the real news. This is the sort of thing we can build right now without anyone else's permission from the government or from the business community. It's the powers in our hands. If we're not gonna sleepwalk into more wars, we think we need to start with a television news network that won't bow to pressure and has the courage to seek facts. And that means independent economics. And that's why we need you. Make a tax-deductible donation now of at least $10 a month or a one-time give of at least $75. As a thank you for your support, we will send you the new documentary film, The History of the National Security State.